Hello, good morning. So we didn't talk about the high priest yet. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your son to come to sacrifice his life for us. We are so grateful for your grace, God, that has poured down on us. And we ask a blessing this morning on the preaching of your word, that it would go out to people in person and also watching on, on YouTube and on Facebook Live. And we know that you are our Father. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So in the Old Testament, we see the high priest, and in the New Testament, we see Jesus Christ. And so we're going to go ahead and compare the two. We're going to compare the two. What's your sign for a high priest? Some people sign priest like a Catholic priest, but because of the white collar, So we see that the priest had a special duties, and he had a special breastplate that he wore, and had a special purpose. So we're going to talk about that a little bit in depth. So the Catholic Church's teaching about the priesthood is different than what the Bible teaches. And so we're going to study about Jesus Christ and how he's the high priest. And um, we're going to delve into that this morning. Like the idea of going to a priest and confessing your sins. You know, confessing your sins to a Catholic priest. And we don't confess, you know, you don't confess your sins to me, you confess your sins to Jesus Christ, but the Catholic Church has a teaching that you have to confess your sins and do penance. And so, but Jesus Christ himself is our high priest. And the priest had a breastplate on, and it had 12 special kinds of gems in it. And they have very special and significant representations. So we're going to talk about that. So, Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of God, and he's also called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. These are two different animals, a lion and a lamb, the king representing, the, the, you know, a lamb representing that he is humble and that he's a sacrifice, and the lion representing and showing his kingship and his royalty. In the Old Testament, we see that priests initiated when men started representing themselves before God. So we see that Adam, Cain, Abel, and Enoch, these people long ago, Abraham, Isaac, they didn't have priests. But they started to commune with God. They started to have fellowship with God. They started to offer sacrifices on an altar to God. The priesthood started in the days of Moses. But we see how the family leader, the male, they, they were the head of the family. They were the head of the family. They were the head of their household. And they were the ones who were responsible. The fathers the leaders, the patriarchy, they were the ones responsible. We see that Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes, each of them, they developed this headship of family, starting with, the, with their descendants. 
So they would confess the sin to God, they would offer a sacrifice, they would have relationship with God. But after Moses, we see that it becomes limited to the tribe of Levi. God chose only the tribe of Levi and Aaron's descendants to be the priesthood for Israel from that point on. And it just became this limited group of people, not just every household leader, not just the patriarch of the family who could offer these sacrifices. It was to be limited to the tribe of Levi. But we see that all of these priests and all of this priesthood talk and so through Levi, there was a lineage and a descendancy. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 17, we see that all of this priesthood, all the priests in the Old Testament, and the ones with the tabernacle, they, like Aaron and his descendants in Exodus, they were following God's blueprint and they were doing what God said. They were offering sacrifices. And the veil, like we talked about, the table of showbread, the golden lampstand, the altar of incense, the basin to clean the water, all these were an imitation of what's found in heaven. And Moses, and Aaron and the Israelites, they made that to imitate heaven. And this tabernacle, really though, it represented Jesus Christ. And we see that in Colossians chapter 2, verse 17. And there are some people who are like, oh, the Old Testament isn't important. We see how everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. And so with the family of Levi, with Aaron's descendants and with his lineage, they were all pointing to Jesus Christ, our Savior. So now we're going to talk about priests in the body of Christ. So the Bible talked about Aaron's descendants, who are Levi's and priests, but now it's not just for the Levites. In fact, the priesthood applies to all true believers. So, for those of you, you are God's priest. You can talk to God. You can have fellowship with God. You can confess your sins to God. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, it says that God has made his people to be a kingdom of priests who serve God. We are involved in the priesthood. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5, and then verse 9, it says, We are a royal priesthood who are to declare God's praises.
we need to, we are under Christ's kingship. So Aaron was the high priest and his sons and his descendants were subservient to him. And in the same way, we as believers are to be subservient to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is to be the head. So I want, if there's one takeaway I want for us to recognize tonight, it's that we, you are, you here today, if you're a believer, you are a priest of God. And so your responsibility is to worship God through Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, People had to just offer a sacrifice and the priest would do the work for them. But now, in the New Testament, we get to be involved. We get to come to church. We get to worship God. We get to have personal fellowship with God. It's so much freedom versus the tabernacle. There was so much bondage. In Christ, we have so much freedom. There was so much weight on the work of the high priest to do everything for people. So right now we're going to talk about ACTS, Acts, Patterns for Personal Worship. So it starts out with adoration. For we are worshiping God, we are adoring him for who he is for us. So we read about in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, we in the New Testament we come before God, and we have an open way to access God because of the cross. So, part two with Acts, a pattern for personal worship is confession. We are to confess who we are before God. We are to ask God to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are to ask God to forgive us of our sins. So, thanksgiving, what God has done for us. We <coughs> should thank God for what? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And then the last part of Acts is the S, and it means supplication, what we need from God. Your kingdom come, give us this daily bread. We can ask God for what we want or need. Remember how the priests would offer incense? But now you can come before God and fellowship with God personally. I can come before God and we can grow in our relationship and our fellowship with God the Father in heaven. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to study about Jesus Christ, our high priest. And we see this 
In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 7, we're going to go ahead and delve into verses 22 through 25. It says, By so much more, Jesus has become surety of a better covenant. So the old covenant, they kept offering sacrifices, but Jesus' blood is so much better. Also, in Hebrews, in the olden times, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. So in the Old Testament, in the days of the tabernacle, they had to have many, many priests. One died, and then the next came and took over, and then they died, and they died, and a new one came along, all through the descendants of the lineage of Aaron. But... Because Jesus lives forever, he has an unchangeable priesthood. He rose again from the dead, so his priesthood is unchangeable. He not only was crucified and died and was buried, but he rose again, so he has this eternal priesthood. In the Old Testament, we see how the priests died out, and it went on to their sons and their sons and their grandsons, and some made mistakes, some sinned against God. We see the example of Eli and his sons were, were doing sinful things and he didn't try to stop them. We see how some were okay and some were decent, but we see how Jesus Christ, he stands out as the greatest of all high priests. He never changes. He's always the same. He is that. And then we're going to read in the next verse in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. If you're saved, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, God will hold you fast. And through Jesus Christ, you are redeemed. You are made alive. It says, therefore, he is also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, Jesus Christ, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus Christ is our intercessor. So when we sin, God can't look at us because we are a stench in his nostril. As sinners, what can we do? How do we pray to God the Father to forgive us of our sins? It's through Jesus Christ. He's the intercessor. He's the intermediary. He's the lawyer who goes to God for us. You know, VRS interpreters, you know, I call, I sign, and the interpreter speaks what I'm saying, and the hearing person talks. We have an interpreter. That in interpreter is an intercessory. Imagine if there was no interpreter. Me as a deaf person, what could I do? How could I communicate? You know, I'm deaf. I don't speak. I can't hear. But it's the same with Jesus Christ. He is our interpreter. He is our intercessor. He's the lawyer. He's our advocate. God's judgment and wrath is coming upon us. But Jesus Christ says this person has believed in Jesus Christ. For those who believe on Jesus Christ, that he has paid the penalty, the penalty, Jesus says, I have taken that punishment. And then we can have fellowship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. He's our intercessory. He's our lawyer. He's our advocate. He is the great high priest. So in the Old Testament, remember, the priest would take a lamb or a bull or a goat or a bird or whatever the sacrifice was. They would take it and a person would come to the priest, say, I need to offer this sacrifice up for my sin. I need God to forgive my sin. And so the priest would say, okay. And the, he would confess his sin to the priest, what he had done. And the priest would take this lamb, this bird, But now we come to Jesus Christ. We don't have to go through a high, to through a normal priest like Aaron anymore because we have our eternal priest. We come to Jesus Christ and we say, Jesus, I've sinned. I've done this and this. And Jesus forgives us. He washes us clean. He makes us clean. And Jesus Christ goes to the Father and he says, these are my people these are my children. Forgive them of their sins. And the Father is well pleased in us through Jesus Christ. God the Father is satisfied in us because of Jesus Christ, because he is our high priest.
Pentecost, and we see how the Old Testament and the New Testament come together so well. If we just neglected the Old Testament, we wouldn't understand the significance of why we need Jesus Christ as a high priest. It wouldn't make sense, but as we read in Hebrews here, we get it. We realize that Jesus Christ, he always lives and he makes intercession for us. And then we're going to look on in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 12, New Living Translation. So Christ has now become the high priest forever over all good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven. So in heaven, God's word says there is a greater, more perfect tabernacle. That it was a copy of things that are in heaven, all pointing to Jesus Christ. But in heaven, Jesus Christ has entered a perfect tabernacle. This tabernacle, so the one on earth that Moses and Aaron made was made by human hands, but the one in heaven was not made by human hands. That perfect tabernacle in heaven is not part of the created world. Verse 12, Jesus with his own blood, not the blood of goats and cows, has entered the most holy place once for all time and has secured redemption forever. So Jesus Christ purchased, he paid for our sins through his own blood. He entered into this perfect tabernacle in heaven. And we are saved through him for that redemption that he purchased for us on the cross. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 14. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow could cleanse the people's bodies from ceremonial, the ceremonial impurity. But verse 14 goes on to think, goes on to say, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself. He went to God the Father and said, I'm a sacrifice for them. And he offered himself up as the sacrifice. You know, the old, in the Old Testament, the, pr the priest would sacrifice the animal to make that offering to God. But now, Jesus Christ takes our sins and he offers his own blood to cover our sins. He doesn't need the blood of goats or bulls, but he sacrificed himself on the cross and God the Father accepted Jesus Christ's perfect sacrifice when Jesus Christ died. Just like the offering of a lamb, Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for your sins. Your sins were placed on Christ on the tree. As we consider the crucifixion, we consider how Jesus Christ he is the Lamb of God, the innocent Lamb who was slain. 
And in the Old Testament, we see how the lambs were burned, their lives were sacrificed. And they were offered up to God, and it was an acceptable sacrifice, a temporary way for their sins to be forgiven in the Old Testament. But now we're going to talk about what Jesus is. So Jesus is the Lot. And so we're going to talk about all of these things. Jesus announced, he said, I am the gate. Jesus said, you couldn't come in any other way. You only had to come to the Father through me. Jesus also said, I am the blood sacrifice. So Jesus says, I am the water. I'm the living water. If you come to me, you'll never thirst. Jesus also says, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. Jesus also is the good shepherd. You read about this and you can see the corresponding, ver corresponding verses in John and in Luke. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd in John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John chapter 4, 16. Different religions, different ways to seek out God. Jesus is the one, the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way to God the Father. He's the only way to heaven. Jesus also said, I am the true vine. Now we're going to turn our attention to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. This is what the angels are singing about Jesus Christ. <coughs> Jesus will be our high priest in heaven. This is a song of praise the angels sing. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure. They are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. This is from Revelation. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the high priest. Jesus Christ, he will have the preeminence in heaven. Here's a drawing of what it might look like. We're going to go ahead and look at a couple of verses. We see how Jesus said, I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. Jesus Christ was greater than the temple. He could have fellowship with God the Father. And Jesus Christ gives us access to the presence of God and makes us acceptable to God. Aaron and his priesthood, they're insignificant compared to Christ. We see that Jesus Christ is also the prophet. Jesus said, now one greater than Jonah is here. Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus Christ proclaims the word of God to us. He is also, not only is he priest and prophet, he is also king. He said, now one greater than Solomon is here. Remember Solomon was considered the wisest and the greatest king of Israel. But Jesus Christ himself has the preeminence of even Solomon. We see that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus Christ rules and reigns in all the affairs of the universe. He protects and provides and works all things out for good to those who love and follow him. A 
for those who love, for those who follow him. Jesus Christ is the one, and it's all to God's glory. <coughs> so we are to keep our eyes and our focus fixed on Jesus. He is our high priest. So we've been studying about the tabernacle. You know, about an hour limited time, and we've had a great time together studying and fellowshipping. And we consider how the tabernacle is just a foreshadowing of what will come. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at this. And there was all these different things that we talked about. And we consider how all of these things point to Christ. The tabernacle, Jesus Christ, he is the tabernacle. And he has come and dwelt with us. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at this next section here. Christ is the high priest. He is a merciful high priest in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. A merciful and a faithful high priest. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it talks about how Jesus is a great high priest who sits on the throne of grace. Remember, Aaron's lineage, all of those priests died. But Jesus Christ, he is a high priest forever. He has no beginning and no end. And he is a high priest forever. Jesus Christ now is eternal and he is in heaven. Revelation chapter 1. We are, God is making us kings and priests to his God and Father. John wrote the book of Revelation, and he saw what it looked like, and he wrote the book of Revelation. God has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, he also made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, it says, And the second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ. The second death, meaning those who are thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity, for those of us who are in Christ, that second death, we are in Christ. We have access to God the Father, and we will not experience that second death. We don't have to worry about the lake of fire as our punishment, because we will be with God forever. So, priesthood is not a new concept. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 2, 3 through 8, at Mount Sinai, God had said way back to his people that they were going to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And in Isaiah 
chapter 61, verse 6, it says, You will be called priests of the Lord, and you will be named ministers of our God. Remember in the Old Testament, you had to go and you had to confess to the priest and offer a lamb or a bird or some kind of sacrifice to pay for your sins. But that system has been done away with. And we ourselves are priests, so we can go directly before God. God has given us the power through Jesus Christ, our high priest, our chief executive. For those of us who believe in Jesus Christ and have accepted him, we are servants of our God. We can have fellowship, and God accepts God the Father, just like he would accept the incense that was burnt before him in the Old Testament. Now, God accepts our prayers. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now, in all these things, we are saying the chief point of this, we have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Jesus Christ. He is the king of heaven. It's all about Jesus Christ, the High Priest. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke of me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Verse 13, And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band,
Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. And another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. Revelation chapter 9, verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And then Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, goes on to say, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Jesus Christ himself is the temple. He is the body. Verse 23 goes on to say, And the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of the Lord illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Jesus Christ himself is that Lamb. There is no need for the sun because Jesus Christ is going to be the light of that city. Let's go ahead and sign this song together. Please let's stand. Revelation chapter 5, verses 19 through 14. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lamb. Thou art worthy to receive glory and power at the Father's right hand. For thou hast redeemed us, thou hast ransomed us and cleansed us by thy blood setting us free. In white robes arrayed us, kings and priests made us, and we are reigning in thee. Amen. Now we'll go ahead and close with prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for this message. Help us to think about it and help us to keep our eyes and our attention fixed on Jesus Christ, our high priest. Thank you, God, that you sacrificed your life and that your sacrifice was that sweet, smelly offering that satisfied God, that when Jesus' blood was spilled, we can be saved through him and through Jesus Christ, our high priest. We thank you, God the Father, that you sent your son to come. I ask God that you keep us safe. Please, God, help us to focus on you. Help us to confess our sins. And if there's someone who doesn't know you, God, I ask that they will receive your gift of salvation today. Because in you, we can have eternal life. 
ask that you keep up a safe God, protect them as they go home. Some people are sick or have different health issues. Please, God, help them to have faith in you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we do have some announcements now. On Saturday at, what is it, 10? Let me look at my phone. So Women of Faith Fellowship is going to be on Zoom at 11 a.m. to 12 this Saturday. W-O-F, Women of Faith. Not Woof Woof, no. Women of Faith. W-O-F. All right? Hopefully it's easy for you guys to remember. It's going to be on Zoom. Saturday at 11. And we will mention it. We'll put it on our on our thing, and we'll put the Zoom meeting link on our, on our page for those of you who are interested. And Chester Brock, do you have any announcements? Yes, I do want to talk about something. I do need a special request for Ray, for our brother Ray, and um, Ray Panuccio, his wife, uh, Shirley, just let me know that on October 15th, he will get a um, partial amputation to remove an infectious limb. So please pray for that, that he would have comfort and that Ray would be healed from his infection. He has pretty severe diabetes in his feet and it's gotten black. So they're gonna have to do a partial you know, amputation of that and he's gonna lose his ability, his calf and his ankle and his foot are gonna be removed. So would you pray for him that it would be successful and um, we're hoping that that infection doesn't spread. They're gonna remove it just above the knee. It's gonna be a very, very challenging thing. And he also has some heart problems and he also has some um, diabetes. His blood sugar is, is not in control. His kidneys are failing. And so I know he's on dialysis for that as well. So he has a lot of health issues. So please be in prayer for Ray, for Raymond. With his health, um, we talked on FaceTime. Just pray for him, he's really struggling. You know, he went to our church for so many years. Year after year, oh my goodness. I think it was from 95. And, you know, he came over here before we, um, you know, he's one of the founding members of our church, one of the fathers of our church who helped found this church. So we just wanna keep, um, you know, he invested so much financially and spiritually, and we're just grateful for all he's done for our church. And we just, we really want to invest in Ray and invest our prayers in him right now because that's what he needs. And he would have peace. And his wife, Shirley, also, that she would know what to do. It's just this heavy responsibility of caring for him and knowing how to care for him. And you know, So please pray for Ray and Shirley. And also, I want to mention a special prayer request for our brother, Kerry. Carrie Van. 12 or 13 years, you know, he was our voice interpreter. He would sit in the front, maybe you remember him. And um, unfortunately, he has cancer. And um, he occasionally has come, but lately he's been staying home. And about a month ago, we received um, the news that the doctors have decided the, the chemo, yeah, I don't know exactly, but the doctors, the chemo is not working any longer. So the cancer is basically, you know, starting to overwhelm his, his body, and the chemo is not effective. It's, it's not effective. So um, he's not going to be, the doctors assume that he'll live less than a year. So they asked for prayers for Carrie, and um, me and Nehemiah actually got in contact with him, and we went over and we visited, and he was so happy to see us. He just gets very tired, because he has to fall asleep, he falls asleep really often. So he gets very, very tired. And then with coronavirus and everything, you know, there's concerns, so. 
if you would just be in prayer for his wife, um, Lori, as well. She also has some health issues that have popped up, and she's trying to pray for Carrie. And also, I ask you that you would pray for Juan Burr. He would come here to church um, for many years. He lives in Gal Ron Burr. Um, him and his wife, um, Phyllis, you know, they would often drive. They drive all the way from pretty far away, and he's, he's getting some dementia. He can't really remember things. But then he remembers some, and his, his walking is much slower now, and, you know, haven't heard from him very much, but from time to time, you know, so, especially the elderly, you got to pray for them, and that they wouldn't forget Jesus, and so I'm going to go ahead and pray for these three people real quick. Our Father in heaven, God, we ask that you would be with Raymond, with his health, God, and as he's expecting to have an amputation on the 15th, and, oh, God, we ask that you would just be with him, strengthen him through that surgery, and we ask that the infection would not spread throughout the entire body, but that they would be able to catch it in the amputation. We ask that he would have peace, God, knowing you. And we also ask that you be just reminding him of your gift of salvation during this time. And also be with his wife, Shirley, as she's done trying to do so much caring for him. It's really, really challenging. It's difficult for her as she faces her own health issues. Give her wisdom and guidance as she empower God to allow me to get through this tough time. We also ask that you be with Carrie Bannon. And we know that his health has... Um, is, is deteriorating, but we're grateful, God, for the years that you gave him to sort of volunteer. Him and Monique and Jen now is taking over the interpreting, and, and you know, we'll see the different health issues our interpreters are facing. God, be with all of our interpreters with the different struggles, but be with Terry Van, God, and we know that um, they're um, experiencing different issues, and we ask that you just be with them and that. Um, you would just comfort and strengthen him. And just remind him about the glorious new body he's going to get in heaven. And then also be with Ron Burr, God. Um, strengthen him also and be with his wife, Phyllis. Be with the two of them, God. Continue to strengthen them and be with them and bless them. We know that these three members of our church are facing very serious health issues. And we know that many other people, like Ricky, who might get a shoulder surgery, but it's been postponed. And we know that so many different people are having so many different health issues, like Son and um, the different people in our church, God, who are struggling. We know that the, these illnesses are part of the curse that Adam and Eve received after they sinned. Our bodies deteriorate, we fall apart, and um, but we're grateful, God, that Jesus Christ has come, that he was buried and he died, he rose again, and he gives us new life, and we're looking forward to heaven, because our earthly bodies are going to deteriorate, they're going to wear out. They're strong for a short amount of time, but then we die. And we know that this earth is temporary but we're looking forward to a new body that you're going to fill this with in heaven. We're pilgrims, and um, we're just on a journey. We're looking forward to the time when you call us home. Could be in the blink of an eye when you take us to be with you in glory. And we also know that the dead in Christ will be raised first, and they will be in heaven with you. We're looking forward to that. And now, God, help us to keep motivated and just faithfully serve you and um, just share the good news with Jesus Christ about Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ had a victory, how he defeated um, the enemy, and in him there's all victory. And, you know, we know that the elections are coming soon, and you know, there's a lot of arguing, and coronavirus has popped up, and all these things. And there's also been 
protest and different groups going out there protesting, these different right wing and left wing groups that are protesting, and the media just throws all of this, and we want to push that aside, and we want to focus on Jesus Christ, because you're the one that gives peace and life. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ during these extremely difficult times. Be with Nehemiah, continue to be with him as he ministers and preaches your word to us, God. Be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. God, keep us standing strong, having faith in you through these perilous times. Until Jesus calls us home, help us to follow you. Amen. The Lord bless you.